everybody especially all our visitors next Sunday we will have a worship sir a Sunday school at 9 30 a.m. and a worship service at 10 30 a.m. and next Sunday we will have our Sunday school picnic please bring a side dish and a dessert and there will be a youth group tomorrow at Kelvin and Debbie's at 7 p.m. for all ages and ladies Bible study will begin on September 22nd at 10 a.m. We will read Psalms 103, 1 through 13, in his name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. It's 
Second scripture reading and prayer before prayer is Romans 14, 1 through 12. I'll read it in Jesus' name. As, as for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eat despise the one who abstains. Let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. He will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes a day observe it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. While the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, Jesus, Father, God, this morning we all come together here to get in your word and worship and praise you. We thank you for this ability. We thank you for giving us a good pastor, Pastor Ray, who continually comes up here and with your spirit within him feeds us that spiritual food that we need. Lord, we pray that in these times, those times that it seems like there's spiritual warfare and darkness shrouding our country, we pray that you would help us all double down in our prayer life, in our time that we spend in your word, so it'll help strengthen us to withstand the, the things that are coming, coming down the pike, so to speak. Lord, we just pray that you would help us all be able to withstand what's coming for lord we know that throughout the country there's all sorts of anarchy and chaos we know that with the elections upcoming we pray that that you would be with president trump for he stands before you he stands against abortion the killing of babies he stands against the child and sex trafficking he stands for against all the corruption the deep state he stands for draining the swamp which is making all the evil politicians and corrupt fellows out there just squirm and they're out there attacking and doing everything they can to destroy our nation, which was founded on your word, Lord. Our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution was ingrained with your word. It was set up that way. The founders prayed for 
wisdom and guidance in creating it. And Lord, our country has been fantastic and awesome ever since, but it's deteriorating. So Lord, we pray that we'd all stand up. We wouldn't have a sense of complacency anymore, that we would stand up without any fear of offending anybody, that we'd just let your word go out, your truth be spoken. Father, I just pray that we had all, a lot of us being of the Scandinavian heritage, that we wouldn't uh, embrace the bad idea that we're all stoic, that we, would, we wouldn't be stoic statues with lockjaw, that you would get us all ready to just open our mouths and be ready to give a testimony, that we would be ready to, anybody that comes out of the darkness, that we would be willing to show them your love and steer them towards you for your honor and your glory. Lord, I just pray that you would just help us all and, yeah, just help us all. I just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Another thing is, uh, after church and the announcements, everybody's welcome to stay around for the graduation party and for tacos and stuff afterward, if you wish. We'll continue with our offertory song.
Good morning. God's peace and welcome. Greetings of grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. About a month ago, we studied from the book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, and we talked about and we looked at the life of Joseph. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of his early life. I did last time. I'm, I'm sure almost everyone here is familiar with um, the story of Joseph, how he was betrayed by his brothers. Um, they um, sold him to uh, traitors. They took his coat of many colors back to his father. They dipped it in blood. They tore it, tore some strips out of it or in it. Um, and so leading, leading Jacob, the father, to assume that his beloved son was dead. Um, and we know if, if, if we were to go through that again, how Joseph ended up um, becoming a very important person down in Egypt to the king there, but it didn't come without lots of trials. It didn't come with a lot of setbacks. Um, one of the, the first setbacks that's recorded in the Bible is his, um, his being tempted by Potiphar's wife and him wanting and desiring to do God's will, um, fled from her, but yet um, a garment was left behind, or she yanked it from him and showed her husband. Well, this ended him in jail. Um, and we know that in jail, he, he, um, he rose to be the number one person below the jailer to take care of and oversee the other inmates in that jail. Um, he then interpreted a couple of dreams for a butler and a baker, and, um, which came true. Um, and he asked one of them to remember him when he was restored to his position within the kingdom, which um, that person promptly forgot him. Um, he languished there in that jail, or should I say he prospered there in that jail for a couple more years until the king himself had a dream. Um, Joseph, well, that finally after everyone had tried their best to interpret the king's dream, um, Joseph was remembered as one who could interpret dreams, and he was summoned. Um, he interpreted the king's dream about a coming time of plenty and a time of harvest. Um, so the king then placed him as overseer um, for the time of plenty and for the time, uh, or the time of, of famine, not harvest, but famine. Um, and all of this, during all of these years and all of these things that, that um, Joseph was going through, he never once is it at least recorded that his faith and his trust in God was diminished. He was a man of faith and a man that trusted God. Um, and I can't help but wonder when all of those things were going on in his life, if he ever had doubts, whether God loved him and whether God was watching out for him. It doesn't say that he did, but I try to put myself in his shoes, and I know I would have. Being separated from your family for years, being trying to do what God's will is and what God wants you to do, and being punished for that, being punished for not, not falling for the temptation that he was faced with, but fleeing, going to jail for it being forgotten by people who told him that they would remember him when the time came, and spending more years in jail. A lot of things happened in Joseph's life that were, in his life, that was not fair. Not fair at all. And yet, he continued to serve the Lord, he continued to trust the Lord, and he was fully convinced that God was with him. And we're going to see now, um, we're going to read a continuation of his life. And we're going to study that a little bit this morning. We kind of ended that 
message, um, that message kind of ended upon when, when Joseph's brothers themselves came to Egypt with their empty grain bags and asked them, ask if he would fill them. Basically, they bowed down to him and, and in a sense, were begging for his mercy and for his, um, you know, his blessing that he would sell them grain to take back to the family. Um, his dream that started all this was that, they, that his brothers would one day bow down to him. And they didn't like that. And now they find themselves bowing down to him and yet they don't know that it's him. And asking for mercy and asking him to sell them some grain to take back to the family farm so that their family would, would survive through the famine. Um, if you remember, there was a, a little, little bit of a game that Joseph played with them. He found out that his father was still alive. He um, asked how things were going back at home. And then in the second trip down... Um, because the first trip to Egypt, the brothers left Benjamin, which was Joseph's true full brother from the same mother. Um, they left him at home because father wouldn't dare, couldn't bear the thought of losing another son. Well, he asked that they bring Benjamin the next time. And um, so they did. And um, Joseph has his golden or his silver cup planted in the grain bag of Benjamin. As they leave to head back home, he sends out people to inspect the bags and they find that silver cup in Benjamin's bag. And they bring, they're all hauled back to court, you might say, before, before Joseph. And Judah, the one who actually was the one that decided to sell Joseph, is the one that then at that time pleads and begs with Joseph that please don't, take don't keep Benjamin here he said my father he couldn't bear to lose another son in other words he's confessing or he's in a sense pleading he says I'll stay here I'll stay here and and take whatever punishment that Benjamin would receive for supposedly stealing that silver cup he says I'll take that and it's at that repentance that Joseph sees from his brother Judah that his heart breaks and it says he just wept. And he acknowledged or told his brothers who he really was and they had a very wonderful time. It says Joseph sent everyone else out of the room so it was just him and his brothers there in that room. But it says people outside that room could hear the commotion going on in that room. And we can imagine that it was a time of just great joy and awe that the brother who they assumed was dead is alive and is actually able to help them. Our sermon today takes place 17 years later. Joseph has forgiven his brothers. He told them he forgave them 17 years ago. 17 years have passed. During the 17 years, the brothers went home, as Joseph asked them to do, gathered up the families, gathered up the aging father, Jacob, and because Joseph had told them, come down here, I'll take care of you. I'm in a, God has put me in a position that I can help you. I can take care of you through this famine. And they did. They came and lived in Egypt. They, they were given the best grazing lands for their flocks because they were shepherds. And they were blessed for quite a few years. Um, J Jacob has now just passed away. They've just buried him. The brothers have just buried him. They've been blessed by Joseph for the past 17 years. He's taken care of them in many different ways. He's never en enacted any revenge upon them. But now Jacob's dead, and he's buried, and this is where our text takes place this morning. That's where we're going to start. We're going to read from Genesis, the 50th chapter, and we're going to read verses 15 through 21, reading in Jesus' name. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil we did to him. 
So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this word that we are able to gather around this morning. Father, this life of Joseph, that, um, that you were with him throughout his life, through so many setbacks, through so many frustrations, through so many times which may have appeared like you were nowhere around, you were there. And Joseph clearly understood that and believed that. Father, we here in Kennewick this morning in this congregation, how often when we face setback and we face turmoil and we face frustrations, do we forget that you are still with us, that you go with us through each and every trial. And we can learn a lesson from this text this morning from Joseph himself that in spite of where we've been, in spite of what we're going through, and in spite of what we will go through, that good can come from that. That there are lessons that we can learn and we can see your hand in the lessons that we will learn and the blessings that we will receive. Father, open our eyes to trust you. Maybe we will never understand why we're going through something at the moment that we're going through it. Maybe we won't understand for many, many years why we had to go through something in our lives. But Father, teach us to trust you no matter what, even in spite of heartache, in spite of trials, in spite of setbacks, and in spite of frustrations. We ask, Lord, that you would open our eyes, be eyes of faith, to be trusting eyes, and that we wouldn't give up, that we would never give up to do what you tell us to do. That we would continually search your word, that we would continually spend time in prayer seeking your counsel. And that we would continue to comfort and encourage others who may be struggling along with us. We ask that this morning this service would be to your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So what's their assumption? What are they thinking as all of these years have gone by? Did they truly believe that Joseph had forgiven them 17 years ago? Nope, they did not. Their, their line of thinking is that, well, Joseph loved dad. And Joseph respected dad, and Joseph honored our father. And when, Joseph, when dad is now dead and buried, that now Joseph is going to get revenge. Now that, jo now that our father is, is, is dead, Joseph doesn't have to honor and respect him anymore. And now he's going, we're going to truly get what we deserve for what we did to him. And it says they, can, they came up with an idea and they sent a messenger or messengers to go and speak to Joseph. And it's kind of interesting because nowhere is it recorded that Jacob said those words. So even in what they said to the messengers to go and bring this message to Joseph, there's a very highly likely chance that they were being deceitful. So they sent some messengers to speak to Joseph and then they showed up. But the messengers come, and this is their message. It says, our father said this, or commanded this, before he died. So these messengers are before Joseph, and they said, Dad said, just before Dad said, he had this message, that you're supposed to forgive the brothers. Forgive your brothers. 
They sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgressions of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And it's very highly likely that Jacob never said that on his deathbed. But this was a concocted plan by his brothers to make sure that, that he would honor his father's wishes or Jacob's wishes even after he was in the grave. In other words, they didn't think, they didn't believe that they were forgiven by their brother. They wanted reassurance that their past sins were not going to come back to haunt them. And they weren't going to get revenge. Someone wasn't going to get revenge for their sins. And how did Joseph respond to this? What did he do? When he heard this by these messengers and then his brother showed up. In 18, his brothers also came and fell down before him. How did he respond? What was his reaction to hearing this message? He broke down and wept. He cried. His heart was broken. Because for the past 17 years from the time that he forgave those brothers, and he truly meant it, and he truly actually forgave them from the bottom of his heart, they have doubted that. And now he finds out many years later that they're still doubting that. And they want to be reassured again that he's not going to take it out on them for what they truly, truly deserve for the, what the punishment or the sin that, came, that they caused for their brother. And it says that he heard that and he just wept. And we say, didn't they get it? Didn't they believe him? I mean, he gave his word. So then the question I have for us, for each one of you this morning, do you honestly, sincerely, truly believe and know that you too are forgiven for your past sins? Or do they come back to haunt you at times? Satan's number one plan and method to take away our faith is to rub our past in our nose. To get us to doubt that we truly are forgiven. And that's why every Sunday when we come to church, or at least hopefully, you're going to hear again and again and again that your sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus on Calvary's cross. And you may at times think, wow, I wish that sounds like a broken record. But we're no different than these brothers in so many ways. Because oftentimes we start to doubt. And we need to hear that we are forgiven, just like these brothers needed Joseph to remind them again that they are forgiven. Please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came down, came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Again they bowed down before him, just like the dream that he had dreamed so many years ago. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? If you remember from Romans, it says that vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. It's not our job to exact vengeance on those that have hurt us. And sometimes, if you're like me, you're like, Lord, go get them. Take care of them. Vengeance is yours, so what's taking so long? And that's not even a right attitude to have, is it? Joseph says, I'm not in the place of God. And as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And that's a little bit hard for us to wrap our minds around. Did God mean, does God mean for evil to happen? No. But can he use things in your lives that were meant out of an evil heart to hurt you? Can he use those circumstances for good in your lives? Absolutely. 
And I think that's where we fail so often is to ask him to show us, to teach us from our past, teach us from heartache and setback and failure. What can I learn from this, Lord? The, in so many ways, some of the greatest Servants, shall we say, that are able to help others through difficult times. Counselors, shall we say, are often, I'll put them in that category. Why are they so good at what they do? Is it because they haven't lived through some awful pain themselves? No, it usually is. They know. They can relate. Was it fun for them to go through what they went through to prepare them for where they're at now? Probably not. Someone said something a while back, and I, I was listening to a, a podcast or a, watching something, and they said that, um, and I can't remember exactly how they said it, and I might have said this before, but they said when they, the, they said um, hard circumstances, a hard life creates character. And so when they go into a crowd of people and there's a real character in the room, they go talk to that person. They want to know what, what they went through in life in order to create in them the character that they have. And that's so true so often. 17 years. Put yourself, we can put ourselves in two different places as we look at this text. We can put ourselves in, the, in, in Jacob, I mean Joseph's spot. We can put ourselves in the place where we thought, we had told someone years ago that they were forgiven. Or maybe we did, maybe they didn't ask, but we forgave someone 17 years ago and we wanted them and we hoped that they knew that. And to find out 17 years later that that person's still struggling. It's heartbreaking. It is. You can put yourself in the place of the brothers. Who even though Joseph said, I forgive you. They've struggled for 17 straight years. Wondering if that's really true. And looking over their shoulder waiting for maybe a day when they're alone. And Joseph shows up and dad's not around. They live in fear. When will he get revenge? As I said the last time we studied the life of Joseph in Genesis, many, there are many parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. Jesus, too, knows what it's like to suffer. He knows what it's like to unjustly suffer when things are not fair. He knows that more than anyone. He could have said, I didn't commit these sins. This isn't fair. I didn't do these horrible deeds. Why do I have to suffer? And yet he knew that the evil of humankind, even our evil sins, that we have committed, that he was carrying to Calvary's cross, he knew that in spite of that evil, God was going to use that for good, just like Joseph believed that as well. And Joseph makes that comment that you meant it for, you meant it for harm, but God meant that this would be for good. So that many would live. And today, we're alive. Because of what Christ did on the cross, which was so unfair on our part. And I believe that if, if Joseph is a type or an example of Jesus Christ who would come later, but who has come and already done his work in our lives, he has pronounced us forgiven. He has pronounced and stated that he forgives you through his blood and through his sacrifice on the cross. He says you are forgiven. And that if that 
if you believe that that sacrifice was for you, you are a saved person on your way to heaven. And if he, if Joseph is the same, an example of that, then how must Christ feel? How must Christ, how would Christ react when we come to him as, un, as unbelievers wondering if it's really true? These brothers came to Joseph. They didn't believe what their brother had said 17 years ago. When he said, I forgive you. Well, Christ has said that to the world 2,000 years ago. He said that from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he also come throughout God's word, we are told that if we believe that, we are a forgiven people. These brothers came to Joseph. They bowed down to him in unbelief. They didn't believe what he had said. They didn't believe that he had forgiven them. And are we today, do we believe that Christ has forgiven us? Or does he weep when he sees unbelief? I believe he does. When people say, I'm, I've been too bad. I've done too many wrongs. How could you forgive me, Jesus? And he says, and he weeps. Why do you doubt me? Why don't you believe me? You're a forgiven person. And you have been since the cross. And in the case of Joseph, you have been for 17 years. And you've been living in fear. And you've been looking over your shoulder waiting for me to bring revenge and vengeance upon you. When you should have been living freely and in joy and happiness. Instead of tiptoeing around, scared that I'm going to get you. This is our Jesus Telling us today, you are a forgiven people, and I mean it. I'm not going to take out revenge on you for something that happened long ago. I forgave you. Rise up and believe it. All of your sins are forgiven, every last one of them. On Calvary's cross, by his blood, and through his resurrection, it's true. And whether you believe it or not, it's still true. And I believe our Christ would be just like Joseph here. Get up. Smile. And believe it. I forgive you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's close in a prayer. Heavenly Fathers, so often we... We need your help, well, not just so often, all the time, Lord, we, we need your help to chase away doubt, chase away the enemy, Lord, that um, so often comes and rubs our past in our nose and says, asks us the question, did God really forgive you? And may we, through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, boldly say, yes, that we are a forgiven people, that our slate is clean that we are on our way to heaven, that we are loved and we are forgiven. And Father, we can't praise you enough for that great gift, that great gift of faith, that great gift of trust. We ask that the same trust and faith that you gave to Joseph, would, that we would experience that in our lives as well. Father, we pray, just want to pray a special prayer this morning, Lord, for the, just for the police officers in our country that are being persecuted right now. They're trying to preserve life and maintain um, unity among your people, Lord, and they're being horribly persecuted for that. We ask that you would give them strength, and we ask that you would strengthen the families of their loved ones. Many of them, many of these police officers and those that are trying to maintain civil order are being persecuted. Some of them are even being killed. And there's much suffering for that. We ask, Lord, that there would be repentance in our nation and in our world to see that these people were placed there by you for our protection to help us. We ask, Father, that you would bless each person who's here this morning. Bless them in the week ahead, in the weeks ahead. 
bless them and, and just teach us, Lord, to love you and love one another, not because we deserve it, Lord, but because we are so loved by you that this would overflow and be passed on to others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Be very sure.